to to start with two apologies. One is I have a cold, so it's probably difficult to hear, but I'll try my best. Secondly, in answer to Tom, I have to excuse that after 60 years in the US, I still have an accent. <laughs> so, so with this, I really would like to go ahead. And I have given myself an impossible task today because looking at everything and at a nice introduction of last year, I read to you what she said. These days, it often seems like science is catching up with fiction. This comes from an article in The Scientist that she wrote. And basically, I would like to show you that from the genetic code that we uh, elucidated in 1965, what is actually happening <clears throat> and how firm the code is, and on the other hand, how difficult, uh, so how different all the, uh, all the different facets are. So with this, I will start. I've always been thinking of who could you compare Gobind to? <clears throat> and I do believe that Emil Fischer, in some ways, is a possible quote unquote father to Gobind. Emil Fischer was professor of organic chemistry in Berlin. And in his most active period for, from 92 to 1919, 1892 to 1919, he really did everything he could on nucleic acid chemistry, i.e. nucleotide chemistry and peptide chemistry. And after his death, very little was done for a decade, simply because he really cleared, cleaned up so many things. He won the Nobel Prize in 1902, and he was a phenomenally important and influential scientist <clears throat> because seven of his group members, students and postdocs, went on to win Nobel Prizes too. So his laboratory had most more Nobel Prizes than anyone else. And I read you from an article that he wrote in 1914, just after he synthesized the first nucleotide of which he did not know the structure. The successful synthetic approaches to this group of nucleotides opened the possibility of obtaining numerous compounds that resemble more or less natural nucleic acids. How will they affect various living organisms? Will they be rejected and degraded? Or will they take part in forming the cell nucleus? Only an experiment can provide the answer. I am bold enough to hope that given the right condition, the latter may happen. That artificial nucleic acids will be assimilated <laughs> and degraded. This must lead to profound organismal changes may be similar to the naturally occurring permanent alterations by mutations. I simply found this <clears throat> astonishing at a time when so little about biology was known and <clears throat> that he predicted this, which really goes together with Gobin's uh, prediction that everybody knows that was written <clears throat> in 68 that in the years ahead, genes are going to be synthesized. The next steps would be to learn to manipulate the information content of genes and to learn to insert them into and delete them from the genetic systems. When in the distant future, all this comes to pass, the temptation to change our biology will be very strong. So I think these two scientists had the same mindset and really uh, and looked to the future in their work. So I simply would like to tell you the many things that I came across. Most of what I said 
uh, uh, most of what I'll say are things that are being uh, have been done in our lab or we are joined others doing it. How the genetic code, as a matter of fact, um, varies from what has been shown that the code is degenerate and redundant and tricks you of genetic code evolution, the frozen accident, we don't know how it happened, but incapable of further evolution. <coughs> so I wanted to show this picture, which is similar to what uh, Tom showed. This is going off to the Federation meeting, the first meeting in 1966, to talk about the genetic code that was solved half a year earlier. And this was at Madison Airport, Tom Branch Mandari, Eiko Otsuka, Hiko Yatsu, Richard Morgan, and Henry Bushi. So what do we know today? Today's known variations, there are over 16 codons. I lost track of since we wrote a review uh, five years ago. Over 16 codons have a different meaning in certain organisms. There are two additional genetically encoded amino acids, selenocystine <coughs> and pyrolysine. Nature reassigns stop codons, which is currently a very big topic, and UGA is for selenocysteine and UAG for pyrolysine. Recoding of sense code is an active research challenge. <laughs> and then there are two genetic code exceptions known that one codon specifies two amino acids, and I will speak about one of them. So uh, we don't have to read all of this. Just look at the red letters here. That simply shows that codon reassignments are actually fairly easy and are quite common. So this is in mitochondria, and basically, Saccharomyces <laughs> cerevisiae mitochondria encode threonine with CUN with leucine codons. This was first shown by Whitman long, long ago, and this is here that the standard code is changed. And how did it happen? So, <clears throat> with the advance in uh, genome science, we know that in Candida albicans, <clears throat> there are genes, Lucetiana synthetase has leucine codons that have the uh, leucine codon CUN, the anticodon is GAU, there is HISRS with histidine tRNA, and uh, then three nil tRNA synthetase that cannot charge this is GUG. In Fibromyces lactis, you can see that this, this um, tRNA is lost. And therefore, the CUN codons are still served by leucine with UUA and UUG. His RS has a GUG codon. <clears throat> and then you go to Cerevisiae. Cerevisiae now <clears throat> uses the additional histidine <clears throat> a single nucleotide change to uh, GUA to GU, uh, GAU that now can recognize the original leucine CU encodons. So with a small tRNA identity change, we can arrive at the explanation for this. And a similar change has happened in the gossipy uh, uh, organism that basically alanine is replaced by this. So single identity changes and gene duplications and gene losses will explain easily this phenomenon. This is textbook knowledge <coughs> that the tRNA decodes the genetic message to the health of the amino acid tRNA synthetase. Parallel tRNA synthetase makes tRNA pro that then is inserted on the ribosome with the help of the genetic code. 
However, the alkoxylate proteolytic pro the correct charge tRNA, but also mischarged tRNA exists, and this is relevant in lethal work. And then, if you look at the amino acid diversity, this is just a nice slide to look at. There are canonical amino acids, the 20 canonical amino acids, and there are the non-canonical amino acids, NCAA amino acids, and you see some of them here. Uh, we'll speak about phosphocerine, selenocysteine, and then there are many phenylalanine derivatives that are uh, chargeable by tyrosyl tyrosine synthetase or pure lysyl tyrosine synthetase, and as the lysine, a lysine derivative, and it's pure lysine that we'll come to. So I'd like to show you the various components of protein synthesis in the living world. And basically going back 60 years already, it was known by a review and bacteriological reviews by Richmond that amino acid analogs are incorporated into proteins when the non-canonical amino acid is added to cell growth medium. No synthetic biology necessary, not at all. This is all there. And furthermore, <coughs> and you'll see this, the amino acid synthetases are polyspecific with respect to non-canonical amino acids. <laughs> when I show you the term of pylorus, you will see that single enzyme variants can charge 12 to even 15 different uh, amino acids. We started with the tRNA-dependent amino acid transformations, the second way of making amino acid tRNA which is the indirect route to asyntiarne and glyntiarne, and basically where a tiarne glyn gets charged with the wrong amino acid glue, or tiarne asyn with the wrong amino acid asp, that then gets amidated while being on a, by <coughs> amidases while being on the ribose, uh, on the tiarne still, so the asyntiarne asyn and glyntiarne glyn is made by this conversion that you can see here. And these tRNA-dependent amino acid transformations are thought to precede evolutionarily the amino acid tRNA synthesis. And the accuracy and the fate of the mischarged tRNA can be, I will address in a minute, but cysteine biosynthesis in some archaea and bacteria occurs in tRNA dependent pathway 2. In methanogens, cystinyl tyrosynthetase is absent and therefore cannot be directly isolated. In a new enzyme, <coughs> phosphoserol tRNA synthetase, sepharis, charges phosphoserine to the tRNA cis to give this mischarged tRNA intermediate, which then is uh, is, uh, is transformed by a PLP-dependent enzyme, sepsis uh, to cysteinesis and to cysteine. And this is the only route to cysteine in methanogens where the cysteinesis is, is um, not present. So I show you that the MAC molecule complexes embody the indirect pathway through to arsen, glyn, and cysteRNA, they, they are shown here that they are organized in a complex of both <coughs> the amidase and the amidase synthetase. So there is channeling within the complex so that only the coplate amino acid tRNA is released to EFTU for protein synthesis, greatly reducing the uh, mistranslation. And in higher eukaryotes, in the cytoplasm only, there are 20 amino acid tRNA synthetases, and as I'll show further, selenocysteine has no amino acid tRNA synthetase. I'd like to briefly talk about organismal fitness and the number of different amino acids. 
We made an observation that was commented on a nice article by last year uh, that carbon source dependent genetic code expansion in acetylhalobium arabaticum. There's an organism that, if you grow it on pyruvate, the proteome has 20 amino acids. But if you grow it on trimethylamine, the proteome expands to 21 amino acids and having pyrolysine in it. And this simply has to do with the fact that with trimethylamine, there is the uh, <coughs> synthesis of pyrolysine is made by pyrolysine synthesis and the tRNA pile that then allows <coughs> pyrolysine uh, to be incorporated. And the organism has absolutely no problem going back and forth uh, with this. And it simply shows the flexibility of what organisms can do. And this brings me to a genetic code reduction. Pyrolysine was found in Methanosacina. Ilke Heinemann and Patrick O'Donoghue decided <coughs> that pile T, the tyranny that is essential for uh, <coughs> making the inc incorporation of pyrolysine should be deleted. They deleted methanosacina, and with it, pyrolysine could no longer be made. And what was the result? The code reduction alters the energy metabolism. Downregulated is methanogenesis from methanol, the most efficient route for methanogenesis, and upregulated is a less <coughs> efficient route methanogenesis from methyl sulfide. So the organism can cope with it again, whether you have 20 amino acid or 21 amino acid. I'd like to show you metabolic recoding. <coughs> And this has been around for many years that you can supplement the growth of an organism with a natural substrate with a natural substrate analog that is very close to the natural substrate. And then the natural TRNA, of course, makes natural uh, product. But then if you have a misisolated tRNA with a different substrate, then this is being made. So we wanted, together with Budiza, replace tryptophan with this particular analog of tryptophan that has sulfur instead of the six ring here. And this can be done because tryptophan tRNA synthesis does charge this. So here is chemical evolution of bacterial proteome, which leads to E. coli without tryptophan. So this is evolutionary step. And we have a Lenski experiment with 280 transfers, a serial transfer in batch culture. So 200 transfers where the reduction of indole in the medium first happens and the reduction of added amino acids happens. And at the end, we restrict the supply of tryptophan neural tRNA and this causes the proteome-wide exchange of tryptophan with the thionyl pyrrole alanine. And the evolved strain is only about 20% slower than the pre evolved trip, and what it does, all 20,899 tryptophan UGT coenons are recoded in the genome, not by DNA changes, but by simply having a substrate, an only substrate for them available. So these are experiments that can be done, and uh, you can see that really the organisms are very flexible. The question then was, <clears throat> uh, six or seven years ago, we wanted to find out how is the genetic code expressed in nature? 
And this had to do with cylindricystine and can a vast amount of genomic and metagenomic information provide the data. And the tRNA sequence structure is the key. And we looked for this tRNA sec covariance model, long and unusual, and then search genomic and metagenomic sequence data. And basically, we saw by looking at many, many, many tRNAs that yes, UGA is a serine codon, uh, sorry, the serine codon in the majority, but UAG can also be a selenocysteine codon, and UGC can be a selenocysteine codon, uh, UGU can be a selenocysteine codon, and a few more. And these two are in extant organisms where we could actually, in these uh, strains, show that selenocysteine is encoded by UAG and by UGU. And we saw all these different tRNAs, and in these cases, we simply had to go into E. coli and show that E. coli will do the job. So the conclusion is that selenocysteine is actually encoded by eight sense codons and three stop codons. These two are the ones where we show this in vivo in their organisms and the other cases in E. coli. And I can give you a rationale later why this is perfectly um, okay. Out of this came something else. We discovered the allotyranes, and these are unlike the exceptions to the old Holly structure as proposed by Holly in Science in 1965. And uh, the canonical tRNAs, and we tease them with five base pairs, accept them with seven base pairs. Selenocysteine tRNAs, of course, have five base pairs and eight or nine base pairs here, but the other tRNAs have a four to eight or a three to nine structure. So these other tRNAs are tested. You find them actually in the um, bacterium, Sylvibacterium bohemicum, and the relevance of this will come later. Can gene expression of a genetic code, can expression of genetic code change RNA modification and genetic code? There are over a hundred uh, RNA modifications in tRNA, but I would like to concentrate only on the sulfur ones here, four thiourinine, uh, two thiourinine, and so on. And if you look at the two thiuridine and decoding, you can find that if if you change the decoding is such that if you have two thiu, it increases stability of codon anticodon interaction, and two thiu a is one to one. 2.5 kilocalories more stable than UA and more stable than this. So if you change the uh, at the base here from, from uh, oxygen to sulfur, the codon can no longer uh, the uh, codon can no longer be recognized that has a G here. So this is actually a, a change that oxygen to sulfur will lead to non-binding of a G. And this has been known for a long time, but this is the explanation, but it goes further, that sulfur transfer is important for many modifications. And uh, sepsis has which you saw the 4-thiuridine synthetase and 2-thiuridine synthetase all have 
a redox, redox, redox active oxygen sensitive RN alpha cluster chelated by three residues, and that's essential for activity of the enzyme. So you can see if there is something wrong with sulfur metabolism, you can actually this influence the expression of genetic code. And I'll give you some of you know, cell in the 21st uh, genetic encoded uh, amino acid, this cell and cysteine, it was from phosphocerine only in here and from cysteine here. And the lower PKE of selenol as compared to thiol is thought to be responsible for the superior catalytic efficiency of selenoenzymes that can be up to a thousand fold more active. So selenocysteine is the only genetically encoded amino acid that lacks an amino acid telling synthesis. It is made, we realized this once we had the cysteine solved, that serotonin synthesis of E. coli, sorry, of serotonin synthesis, puts onto selenocysteine tiane serine, and in bacteria, one enzyme uh, will modify serine to selenocysteine. In us uh, here in eukaryotes, there's a kinase that will phosphorylate the serine, and then sepsic acid, again, a PLP dependent enzyme will convert this via dehydroalanine <coughs> to selenocysteine. These are essential enzymes, and it simply shows the two primordial roots. And I show this because it's a nice looking slide. And this is the cell E, the bacterial enzyme, a <coughs> beautiful ring of 12, sorry, of 10 uh, subunits with 10 TRNAs bound. And it's very, very different from septic acid in our hair that is doing the same job I had done by Sudaria and my Marcus Brucker. What you really wanted to see, can we rewire cellulosystine pathway? Because cellulosystine is not incorporated like, <coughs> um, like all the other amino acids. Nature evolved a different uh, transfer factor. So EFTU that takes, of course, this, the amino acid TRNA to the ribosome uh, cannot take a cellular-assisting TRNA to the ribosome, but there's cell B. And furthermore, cell B is recognized by a large element about 65, I mean, uh, 65 nucleotides, which in bacteria is within the coding region. So the uh, game of playing mutagenesis amino acids is difficult and can't be done unless we do it differently. So we made, in this case, a different enzyme, a different tRNA. And in this particular case, this allo tRNA, and I choose the allo tRNA because we think it does not interact with as many uh, elongation factors as uh, you normally have. So we can get site-specific insertion of SEC into proteins programmed by UAG, and this is designed tRNA, and then the other tRNA is very efficient, and in this particular case, we can really get then iron sulfur clusters where the sulfurs are, are, are replaced by selenium and the enzyme is perfectly active. But we wanted to go further and develop a sex specific reporter. And for this, we used an intein. And the intein is inserted into uh, the a gene that, uh, that of the reporter, which in this case is the calamycin uh, resistance enzyme, in team is, uh, can be uh, uh, 
supplies out. And if we have a C here, or a, a self, sorry, a, a serine is not active in engine splicing, but selenocysteine is. So when we have the right product here, the, the intin is spliced out, and we have a reconstituted reportal gene that has no longer the intin in it. And cysteine and selenocysteine work in a similar fashion. And so this allowed us to screen for uh, tRNA genes with selenocysteine. We then went on a collaboration with Jody Puglisi at Stanford to really see in a single molecule characterization on a ribosome, what do we see? And we see low translational processivity of tRNA UTU. And in tRNA UTU, you can see the control tRNA, we can really get easily six codons being read, while the tRNA UTU is very poor in red here. So we went ahead by cryolem looking at what may be affecting the translational processivity in uh, on the ribosome, and we saw that the variable arm is responsible, and it turns out that this C in position 8 here is very important. We then went ahead and modified the C to an A, and when you do this, you can see the new tRNA is no longer like the red one here, but like the green one, it is perfectly fine. And you can see the processivity has gone up, and with this then, we improved the system. Pluralizing the evolution. So the 22nd genetically amino code amino acid pure lysine. We already talked about pyloracy enzyme that charges it and tiali pile. Pylorus variants charge about 200 non canonical amino acids. This is pure lysine, boc lysine, and iodophenylalanine, which we'll come to. And that simply shows you all uh, some of the TRDs can be charged. So, some of the individual variants charge up to 15. So this was my <coughs> my statement that uh, the enzyme is really very promiscuous. But recently, we found out <coughs> all the TR pylorises exist. The original ones have two domains, n terminal c terminal domain, there are fused ones also, but most interesting recently, just the C-terminal domain enzyme that you see here. And uh, Patrick O'Donoghue, together with Rosalva, uh, did the structure of the disulfid bacterium CDP, uh, a pylorus, and different from all other synthetases. The tRNA reaches here, I uh, sorry, the enzyme reaches here inside the L. And this is only found in the in the uh, pylorus. And Tateki Suzuki uh, did the end terminal amount also. And basically, we now know that the discrimination against canonical tRNAs is based and a lot of arm. Where are we? Four minutes, okay. So, uh, we are working with, going to work with the organism Methanohal Archaeum Thermophilum. This organism 
is a, a very deep branching archaeon. It's extremely holophilic. It grows in 86% saturated soil. So the biochemistry is not possible. So we transferred all the genes in Halifax Volcani. And what we want to find out is when did uh, when did pyrolysine, as a matter of fact, happen in the genome? And we found that uh, HMET has two pyrolyzed enzymes. Uh, uh, you see them here, and pyrolyzed two sees only has a deletion in motif two loop, and in uh, and pyrolyzed two sees the following tRNA. There are two tRNAs also in each one. One is a G discriminator base, one is an A discriminator base. This is the only example where you actually find the A discriminator base. And with studies that uh, together with Kunin, we found out we do have 105 organisms that have tRNA pile with a uh, G73, two have an A73, three have a U73, and a pilarized here on the pile two, the A73 pair is the ancestral one and it got lost. But pile is a member of the original RCL genetic code. So it came in with the RCL. It was lost by many RCL and also transferred to bacteria and there may be a, a link to methanogenesis. Now, this is, a, this is a collaboration. As you can see, we want to initiate translation with natural amino acid in living cells. So the goal was to develop a synthetase and a tRNA pair that initiates with non-canonical amino acids. And when I searched my memory, I realized that Umesh Roshni and Tom Rajmandari, who you know well, published a very important PDS paper in 1990 that, as a matter of fact, in E. coli, UAG can be used as an initiation codon. Based on this, we wanted to see, could we take methylphenylalanine and have tyrosyl tRNA synthesis to really do the job. And what is happening, it actually worked. And I'll show you in a bit how. And it gave us a very interesting cover of the journal, which is a very important paper. And basically, I would like to tell everybody listening that it is very important in a collaboration who you pick as a collaborator. And for the future, if you really want to have a very important paper, do pick Umesh Varshni, and then you get your very important paper. That's the audience. So Tom Rashmanari showed that this is where the initiated tRNA uh, is important, uh, elements for the initiated tRNA. And, uh, for tyrosyl tRNA synthesis, we want to get an initiator that can be used for tyrosyl tRNA synthesis. So we made a chimeric initiator tRNA that had the recognition elements for tyrosyl tRNA synthesis and the initiator elements here in it. And this then gave us an amino acid tRNA that started with UAG, and we have the unnatural amino acid here. And basically, <laughs> we can incorporate methylphenylalanine and wort and methionine or no amino acid. It's not working. This is my last slide, and I will. Thank you. I put this in for last year because this is the second uh, example 
of one codon, one codon, two amino acids. So this is sense codon mistranslation by a dedicated aminoacylsynthesis DNA pair. And it comes from the fact that Streptomyces has three protocharlic synthetases, and one of them, Proys X, is only found in Streptomyces and predominantly in pathogenic Streptomyces species. And Proys X and a TRNA pro can mistranslate alanine code on GCU with proline. Well, there's any relationship of the of this with the pathogenicity, we do not know, but among all organisms, we only found it mainly in pathogenic streptomyces, in pathogenic streptomyces species. And Oscar Vargas got a grant from NIFA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, because and the potato scab disease uh, costs about 5% of the American, of the U.S. potato crop. And maybe this has something to do with this mistranslation that we see here. And basically, these are the genes. This is the ProSX, only shown in pathogenic species. And the TRNA Pro and TRNA ALA is there, and the TRNA Pro A has an alanine anticodon and still the proline identity element and is recognized by proline synthesis. And the last thing I'll say here the other amino acids also asparagine and <coughs> threonine that can be recognized by this proline synthesis. So, if I go back, archaea that we thought are very different from bacteria, they have a few domain-specific translation components, but otherwise, all the components that we found in various organisms are found everywhere. And clearly, if a new translational scheme evolved, nature will use it anywhere and is in, not interested in how we have characterized it. But the most important thing is that the genetic code is very much more flexible than thought, even though it is really a firm, a firm structure. So I would like to thank first Gobin, because without Gobin, I would not have become the workaholic scientist that I am. And want you to do all these things. And whenever I saw something that I looked, it looked interesting, I just went ahead and did it. And I was very, very happy that uh, it went well. I was very fortunate. This is my last whole group. Most of the people have disappeared in the last three months. Christina Chung, Kexin Meng, Danny Chung. Jeff Thorpe, Natalie Kran, Oscar Vargas, and Dominic Schunterman. And I had many, many collaborators. And this is really very important. And the last thing I have to say, I was fortunate to be supported by the Department of Energy and especially by the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. I had a single grant from NIGMS that was paid without any interruption for 47 years. So I was really very fortunate, and I thank everybody, and I thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Zoll, for your for this fascinating glimpse into rewiring the code and for your warm words and personal touches through the talk. We have two questions. Uh, I'll start with these two. The first question is, Given the importance of tRNA synthetases, how is it that 
living systems tend to lose them. Are they not under pressure to maintain them all the time? I believe, uh, I, I believe that the amino acid, the amino acid, these are not the original um, instruments that um, uh, that executed genetic code. Uh, I believe the RNA structures that might have done it, and these RNA structures then became very likely RNA protein enzymes, like we have seen, and then the amino acid synthesis. Um, the amino acid synthesis clearly um, are very specific and discriminate between the normal canonical amino acids. But if you have an earlier version, uh, it could very well be that there was an enzyme that would have charged methionine, leucine, isoleucine, and valine as the, let's say, hydrophobic enzyme, uh, uh, amino acids. Uh, and that, <laughs> that enzyme later uh, became then uh, specialized. So, there's a lot. There's a lot of speculation and work to find out which amino acids might have come first, and which amino acid synthetases have come first. And there's really very little known. Uh, that many, many different. Hartman, for instance, has many thoughts on the amino acid synthetases. And cysteine and phenylalanine are, are thought to be newer amino acids, but I cannot give you an answer to your question. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, so the next question, uh, somebody asked so very interesting, does codon bias influence the incorporation of non-canonical amino acids? I would imagine. I would imagine that this is the case. No one, no one has really looked uh, looked at this, but uh, it, it is it is clear that the codon bias um, is is important for the efficiency of uh, normal amino acid incorporation. So it very likely will be for non canonical amino acids also. Um, there's a lot of work being done to really see whether you can, how many non-canonical amino acids you can actually uh, put into one protein. And the, there's old work, work on luck I that, for instance, says that there are not too many totally conserved positions where the amino acid has to be the same. So there's a figure that is being banded around that 55% of the positions in the protein don't care which amino acid is in it. If this is correct, then, then really you could get non-canonical amino acids in to many, many proteins. And Hillingworth showed oh, 10 or 15 years ago that you can make, for instance, triosphosphid isomerase out of not only from nine amino acids. So nine types of amino acids. So it's a long, it's a long protein, but it's, it's only nine types of amino acid. So clearly, Things will have to be done to show uh, what the cell can get away with, so to speak. And much of the work you asked the question in your early article, uh, much of the question is when you, when you do misincorporate, so to speak, misincorporate. This is possible because you actually have degraded the quality control elements of protein synthesis. 
And the more you degrade it, the more you can get uh, the misincorporated proteins. But you will not be able to get all of them. Uh, otherwise, the organism is, is not uh, is not viable anymore. But basically, and you are working on this currently, the idea that you, that mistranslation is good upset most people. And we showed this in 2005 and 2008 <coughs> that mistranslation is actually happening and you can select for it, otherwise the organism dies. So you come down to it, mistranslation is seen today by many people as a way of, as you have, uh, <coughs> To, to deal with stress, with heat, with many other elements. And one of the ideas that we liked about the streptomyces and the mis mistranslation is that maybe the mistranslation is there in order to get the, the streptomyces into the organism, into the potato. Because it it really, it really will reduce the defense that that potato has if you have mistranslation. So mistranslation is good, and mistranslation is bad, and I I believe that every dogma that we have in biology has an exception or exceptions. But the younger people have to solve it. Thank you very much. Maybe very quickly, one last question that I see here in the box. Uh, so Sudha Bhattacharya asks, from your vast experience, would you agree that the genetic code assignment is indeed a frozen accident? Or do you think there was a chemical logic to it? Yeah. There is work. There's a lot of work and I do not I do not have all in my mind. But I think the experiments that show that the chemical logic is not working. And one way in the slide that I had to show that aspartate attached to tRNA can be converted into asparagine or glutamate or glutamine, the chemical properties of aspartate and of, glut and of asparagine are really very different. And it has been uh, taken by some people to say that uh, this will argue against the chemical hypothesis. And there's other ways too.